First Minute Capital is a $100 million seed fund, proudly backed by a number of tech founder LPs, including 30 unicorn founders. Part of our DNA is to take wisdom and lessons learned from one generation of successful entrepreneurs and share those lessons and pieces of advice with the next generation of successful founders. And that's really what this webinar series is all about. My First Minute is a fun opportunity to speak informally to some of the world's top founders on the first minutes of their careers, how they see the world, and general leadership advice. My name is Clara Lind Bergendorf. I'm an investor at First Minute Capital. And today, I'm speaking with Neerich Shah. Uh, Niresh, as you all on this call will know, is the founder and CEO of Wayfair, one of the world's largest online destinations for all things for the home. And not only one of the largest, but it's really one of the fastest growing e-com sites uh, right now. Your 2020 numbers are absolutely astonishing. It seems like as we all are spending more time at home, we're also spending more money on our home, <laughs> as evident by, by your earnings. At Q1, you saw 20% revenue growth. And since March, your share price has gone from $27 to $211. And your market cap is now exceeding $20 billion. So I think it would be almost a crime to, to start this conversation in, in any other way than to ask what the last couple of months have, have been like. I can imagine super exciting on the one hand, but on the other, it must be operationally challenging to try to keep up with literally billions worth of, of new demand uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, tell us about that, Niresh. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, well, so, you know, we're, on one hand, we've been a company that's been accustomed to growing quickly. Um, the, for the last five years, our, our compounded annual growth has been 42% per year. So we've been doubling at a rate of every two years being twice as large. And last year, we we're just shy of 10 billion in revenue. Um, but I would say what's been a, a challenge is that, you know, since, um, you know, in the quarter, a couple of weeks ago, we gave an update and quarter to date. So the last two, three months, we've been growing in 90 percent year over year. And so just growing from, you know, adding you know, basically doubling in size is uh, put a lot of strain, as you said, on the physical operations. Think about it, supply chain, transportation, customer service. That's just a tremendous volume that on one hand, we have a very nimble and agile team. On the other hand, it took us, uh, it, it took us obviously by surprise. And we were growing at a good rate, but then all of a sudden, a super fast rate. I would say that it probably took a month to feel like we had kind of adapted to efficient processes around social distancing and, and safety and health in the warehouses and transportation and kind of uh, figure out how to make sure that we could handle that volume more consistently. And then on the customer service side where, you know, we have 3,000 people, it's, it's, we're constantly hiring and trying to grow that team to handle the volume. But it's, it's, it's been a fun challenge, but it's been a challenge nonetheless. It, it really is one of the biggest success stories of, of 2020. How much should we attribute this to, to lockdown and what's going to happen to Wayfair post-COVID? Uh, well, I think the reason we've been able to grow at that 42% per year, when you look at the last five years, is simply that even at the nine plus billion uh, that we did last year, that's still a pretty small percentage of the market. So when you think about home goods, so we're, we're um, only in home goods, but home goods is everything from furniture and decor to the, the finished parts of uh, DIY or home improvements, so lighting and plumbing and flooring and tile, white goods, and um, you know everything in your garage, in your backyard, in front of your house, um, and housewares. That's about a $400 billion market in the US and Canada, and about a $400 billion market in Europe. And so we view it as us only having a little over 1% share with a lot more for us to do, and our ability to grow pretty, pretty uncapped. And so even with double that, you know, you can say we have 2% share now or what have you, we believe this is a category that's going to increasingly move online. And by having a platform that's very focused on only on home, all the things that matter around the aesthetic and browsing the selection and getting educated about the item, and then the kind of complex nature of the deliveries, these are big bulky items prone to damage, generally deliveries a hassle, making that easy and convenient. 
we think that we can be the go-to platform. And so what's happening now is I think while we were going to continue to get these customers over time and continue to grow for you know years and years to come, I think you probably have a few years worth of growth just compressed into a very short period of time where customers who are bound to tip in sooner or later are all giving it a try now. And similar to online grocery, it's a category that it is done very well online, but for a customer, there's various forms of fear or uncertainty that prevent them from per perhaps starting. And once they try it out, though, they have a strong point of view. And what you really find is once they try it out, they're like, hey, this is pretty convenient. This is pretty good. Selection is great. And they kind of stay with a portion of their spend online and the portion of the spend that's online grows. And that that is basically what gives um, us a bright future and keeps us very excited. And I think that's such an important point to, to make as well, that even if you're, of course, experiencing COVID tailwinds, that type of growth wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for all the, the thoughtful work preceding it. And in a way, I think that actually reminds me a little bit about the Wayfair situation back in 2011, when, again, a lot of people were referring to Wayfair as this overnight success story. But that wasn't really the case at that time either, because... 2011 was on the one hand the, the year that you took the name Wayfair and the year that you brought on venture capital for the first time. But at that time you had been operating the company for something like 10 years already and uh, we're doing around 500 million in revenue. Uh, but you were operating not as one site the way we know it today, but as 250 individual websites. So clearly the first iteration of the company was, was, was quite different uh, can you take us on that that journey back to 2002 and uh, and the very first website? Yeah, so so Steve Conine and I, who are the two co-founders of Wayfair, we actually started our first internet business right out of college in 1995, and we had sort of the good fortune in the super early days of the internet to really get um, kind of firsthand experience with various different internet businesses and uh, the technology and what have you. And so by the time we were starting at the time it was called CSN stores, obviously now today called Wayfair in 2002, we already had a pretty good understanding of the internet. And we certainly were in the group of folks who thought that the future was incredibly bright. Um, at the time though, in terms of figuring out what our next idea was, e-commerce was an interesting one because it was not viewed as a particularly good sector because of the dot-com crash in 2000 and 2001. And so, we ended up coming across a bunch of data that basically showed that e-commerce was actually doing just fine. It was continuing to grow and just keep ticking away. And that while the stock market had gotten very you know, exuberant and then crashed, the actual consumer demand had not done that. Consumer demand was just kind of continuing to grow. And so we ended up picking, you know, our view was that national retailers had a lot of the major categories covered, but there were niches that were not covered. And they, you know, so certain of them had complexity. And so there was opportunity. And so the first one, the first website we launched was called Racks and Stands, and the first category was TV stands, speaker stands, and basically entertainment furniture. And entertainment furniture in, in the United States is about a $3 billion a year annual category, so it's not particularly large, not particularly small. Um, but there was sort of no one who would be a specialist in it. It was a hard category. And long story short, our idea was that, well, we could keep launching these different narrow websites in these types of categories. and we could be the place you would find online when you decided you wanted access to selection, what have you. What ended up happening is just in the first few months, we ended up becoming one of the larger sellers of, of uh, TV stands. And so our suppliers started telling us, hey, we have, we have these other categories, other online guys sell more beds or more desks. And so what we did over that first decade is we started going category by category through furniture, then we went category by category through decor, then, then home improvement, housewares. And so we ended up, as you said, with 250 sites, and through that, we sort of realized that we really could provide a great experience. But the challenge we had was just customers wouldn't remember who we were. They didn't realize we had all these other sites. And that's what led us to the point of realizing that well, with, with a brand, we could potentially become the go-to place for all things home. And in many ways, we had built a lot of the infrastructure for it in terms of supplier relationships and, and the delivery infrastructure. But, you know, we were going to be capped at what the size would be. And, that, and that's what led to the to, to launching Wayfair. Amazing. I, I love that. <coughs> and, uh, back in 2002, everyone's saying e-commerce is dead. You're saying 
it's not so much that e-commerce is dead, it's, it's just right about identifying the right category where, where e-commerce makes sense. And clearly you found, you found that category, but how did you then go about uh, building defensibility? Yeah, so what's interesting, um, the, the home category, when you think about retail goods, most retail goods are more or less branded commodities. And so there's quite a few different people who sell branded commodities. So if you think about like double A batteries, well, you know, Walmart or Target or Amazon, they all have the same Energizer, Duracell, same brands. And you could buy it from any one of them. You could buy any of these brands. They're basically identical products. And that's about 60% of total retail sales are in those categories. And about 20% are in grocery, grocery obviously being different. But again, in the middle of the store, more or less looks a lot like what I just described on the 60%. And then the outer rim where you get to the perishables and the you know, meat and the, the, the fruits and vegetables, it's, there's some more complexity. And then there's two pieces left in terms of the big markets. And one is fashion, which is about 10% of total retail. And one is home. And what's interesting about home is it doesn't really have brands in the same way, only until you get to the luxury end are there brands. And then it has a lot of delivery complexity, but the damage issues are in a complexity, the cost of delivery and making it easy for a customer is a complexity. And then product discovery for a customer is the third big, big, big issue because they crave selection because they don't necessarily want the same item as everyone else. They actually want a unique item, but they want the perfect unique item because they're not going to buy that particular type of item again anytime soon. And so what we've done over time is our competitive advantage has basically come out of the fact that we have the largest selection while still making it navigable and helping you find that perfect item and have confidence that it does, it will work the way you want, it will be of the quality you want, it is the item you're envisioning. The second thing is basically around how we handle the delivery and the service to, to really um, make, make the experience uh, 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 you know, quite, quite good for you. Um, and the third is the way in which we work with the supply side to really facilitate the, the whole relationship because it's not, it's, the suppliers tend to be small to medium sized companies and there's many, many of them. And so being able to get that to work is quite a specialized type thing. And am I right that quite, uh, quite a big portion of your selection is, is private label brands as well? So what we do, so we don't actually design product and we don't actually carry our own inventory. But what we do do is in the non-branded portions of our category, so that's about 80% of our categories are non-branded. We'll actually create our own brands, you know, or collections. We'll then curate in items that come from the various suppliers into collections that are style and price point quality oriented. And we'll do the merchandising work to tell the whole lifestyle story. So instead of you having to go to a much higher price specialty retailer to get that level of merchandising, you can actually get it from Wayfair. And it makes, again, the, the concept of you finding an item you're looking for and in envisioning it in your own space, it makes that much easier. Uh, and uh, all different sorts of, of price points. Was that key to, to your strategy from the, from the very beginning to be able to serve uh, such, a, such a diverse target market? Yeah, so our goal, in an ideal world, our goal would be to have the entire selection available in the whole world. All right, now that there's various frictions that prevent that, but the basic idea is that if you have everything, you then, on one hand, you definitely have what the customer wants, but you've created a complication of how do you help the customer find that item. So the way we think about it is, let's, let's try to have everything and take on that challenge then of also, how do we then also make it easy for someone to find what they're looking for? And by doing both, you end up offering the customer the best experience. And so Wayfair is meant to have everything from the opening price points all the way up to the beginning of premium. And then we have a luxury platform called Paragold, which basically is only luxury. It's only the, the, the premium end of the market, the brands you tend to find in the design centers and so on and so forth. And to solve curation for the, for the customer there, I've heard that AI is pretty, uh, pretty important. Do you want to talk a little bit about the emerging tech, uh, tech trends that you've been kind of at the forefront of and, and uh, that you find that you think are critical to, uh, to Wayfair being where it is today? Yeah, so I think that's one of the things that's given us a big advantage is being um, always thinking about how to use technology in an innovative way. And so today, even out of the 16,000 plus people at Wayfair, there's about uh, 3,000 people in customer service, about 5,000 people who work in our logistics operations. And of the 8,000 people who work in our corporate offices, 3,000 of them are building software. 
So 3,000 of them are, are software engineers, product managers, uh, designers, and then we also have hundreds of data scientists as well. And by, by having this team uh, very tight knit working on each area of the business, you're able to really do things that others can't do. And from your point about um, AI and machine learning, data science, you know, in Merch, it's a pretty, um, you're able to use that kind of complicated approach in quite a few areas of our business, given the amount of data we have access to. But in merchandising, it's, it's one place, for example, that you're able to get tremendous gains and wins. Everything from identifying new items, being able to predict which new items might become the popular items. So you can know which items perhaps to, to kind of give more of a more of a push for to how do you, um, a lot of the different tagging and nomenclature of how you help customers navigate the catalog, you find that these algorithms can outperform what you could do with human tagging. And so there's a lot of ways that we use AI and everything from how we do marketing to how we do merchandising to how we run our operations and our supply chain. And we're constantly trying to make that better because just the, um, you know, I think some folks look at it as an expensive investment area, but when you look at the unlocks and what you can do for the experience, it's actually one of the most productive things you can do. It seems like that has been your, your strategy to really invest in, in in-house teams and building, bringing things like logistics and, and technology in-house. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about your, your vertical integration strategy over the last uh, 18 years and how you've gone about deciding whether to uh, build these competencies in-house from scratch or to, to acquire businesses with these competencies. Yeah, so we, we've definitely been more on the organic path than the acquisition path. And generally, it's because our core philosophy at the end of the day is we want to be very oriented around our customers and be as ambitious as we can be. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we, of course, have competitors who are in a similar market and have a similar view. And so we think the reason we outpace our competitors really comes down to our team. So it's sort of the caliber of the team. It's the culture that then empowers that team the way in which they work together and, and can accomplish things, the way in which we keep a very entrepreneurial view of the world, regardless of our size. And so at the end of the day, what we found is that when you invest so much in the culture and in the ability to find and attract and retain great people, it's a lot harder to do an acquisition and feel like you're going to get further than just adding people to the team. Because if you do it in the organic way, you, you already have a culture that you really think is powerful and you can progress it. And if you make acquisitions, you generally will not have an ideally similar culture. And so it can be more challenging. But <clears throat> we do think as we grow, acquisitions will definitely play a role as we continue to expand. And so it's, it's a question of like, how do you, how do, you do that in a way that's, that's really helpful for both businesses? And that's something that I think we're in the early days of really uh, learning about. You know, five years ago, we made a big commitment to expanding in Europe. Uh, four years ago, we made a big comm commitment to building out our end-to-end -end physical logistics infrastructure. A lot of today is not necessarily about new commitments like that, but it's really all the things we have underway. How are we really pushing those forward very aggressively? Because there's just so much more room. And you mentioned your, uh, your international strategy there. And I uh, always find it fascinating when, uh, when U.S. entrepreneurs go, decide to go, uh, go abroad, given how, how large uh, the, the market is in the U.S. alone. Uh, how did you decide when the time was, when the time was right for Wayfair? Well, to be honest, we, um, you know, I wouldn't say we were perfect on that. We started um, with an effort in Europe in 2008, 2009, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that that was too early. You know, we, we basically, we didn't have the resources to really commit enough um, to the market to really be successful in the way that we wanted to be. And so for a few years, our efforts there just didn't achieve, you know, they grew, but we didn't really achieve the potential that we knew was there. And we really didn't have the confidence that the approach we had was going to win. Um, and so then by the time we got to the summer of 2014, we then, we'd grown significantly. We had a lot more resources. We really made the decision. We said, well, you know, we don't want to dabble. We want to be a leader in everything we do. So if we really want to be in Europe, we really need to commit to building out a, a really strong team and really resource that business. And so that's when we started um, ramping up the team. I think in the summer of 2014, we probably had less than, 100 people in Europe and we were, you know, sort of a bit player in both, both the UK and Germany. Today, we have over 2000 people in Europe. We're, we're the leader in home in the UK. We're 
Um, we have a well-known brand in the UK and in, in Germany, we're maybe a year and a half into building the brand there. It usually takes about three to four years, but it's growing quite nicely. And so now we're seeing the real results, but it, it took us a while to really understand that expanding into a new market, really the kind of commitment it takes. And so today, that's a lot of how we think about things up front when we have an idea, well, what would it take to win? Are we ready to commit to that or not? And if we're not, then maybe now is not the time to start. Maybe we wait till we really are willing to commit. And it's not like you do everything all at once, but you just, you want to have an understanding of what it, what it would take and make sure you're willing to keep and you have the capability of investing uh, along that journey. Well, selfishly, we're, we're really happy that you have a big office in London and it will make it easier for us to convince you to come and, come and visit us often. Uh, but let's zoom out a little bit for a second and uh, talk about your relationship with Steve, which I find fascinating. Uh, you guys have been co-founders for something like 25 years now, um, three ventures, as you mentioned before. I think you met already at high school, started your first venture in, in, in university, as you said. Uh, what's the recipe for a successful co-founder relationship, I could say? Well, I think you need to, so you need to have someone who shares your, um, you know, the, the, the excitement and, and view of what you want to do. And then you need to make sure that you both have significant amounts of mutual respect in terms of uh, listening to each other. Cause needless to say, there'll be items you disagree on, or one of you has a stronger point of view or, or, or different point of view or understanding of an item. I think the other thing which ends up being a challenge sometimes for, for co-founders is, and this just worked out for us, it just happened by happenstance, but it works out very well when you have complementary skills and you're drawn to different areas of the business. Because anytime you sort of have to carve up who's going to do what, and both of you want to do something and neither of you won't want to do something else, it gets very difficult because I think people really, it's very hard to be very happy unless you're really working on things that you're particularly excited about, you know, say you also need to be good at them. Um, and for us, we had quite complementary skills, which in the beginning, we didn't realize that, but you know, I was gen generally more um, oriented around the general management of the business and the commercial side. Steve was more oriented around the technology side. And that partnership, that was really the basis, you know, and then we knew each other well and we trusted each other. And that was really the basis off which we really built the whole business partnership, which is, as you said, you know, after 25 years, it feels very, very natural at this point. That, that said, I've heard that when you, when you guys started out, you thought that you were going to lead the, the, the technical side and that Steve was going to lead on, on marketing and business. Is that, is that right or is that just a rumor? No, that's the plan we came up with. And that lasted about three months into our first business. And ever since then, it's sort of <laughs> a reverse course and we've stayed on the alternate course the rest of the time. What, what was that conversation like? Was it just one day you... You know, Steve shows up and says, this code is really shit. I got to do it all over again. Let me take over or, or the other way around. You know, it was pretty natural because we just, you know, sort of gravitating to being interested in the other thing. And, and it kind of worked out well because we were both, you know, gravitating to being interested in the other thing. Right. And so that's what made it easy. Would you say that the recipe for a, for a successful marriage is the same as uh, for a successful co-foundership? I mean, there's a lot of similarities, right? Because I think, you know, learning how to work with someone else, right? Cause you're not always gonna have the same views and making sure you can listen and you, you're not so confident that you're always right, that, that you, you, do, you lose the ability to listen and um, th that matters. And so I think there's a lot of the same principles, right? That let you succeed. We've, uh, we know that your, your wife is an uh, entrepreneur herself as well. Uh, what's the division of labor like at, at your home in Boston? Who's, uh, who's decorating the home, for example? Uh, my wife is definitely the one decorating the home. She has the eye. She has the eye for the product. I, I um, if I decorated the home, I, I'm not sure it would have quite the same character that it does now, and it's fantastic. So I'm I'm very happy to just be the be the beneficiary. Is she using uh, Wayfair furniture? Absolutely, everything is either from Wayfair. We have five brands: Wayfair, Jocelyn Maine, All Modern, Birchlane, and Paragold. And you know, for years, everything we buy is you know from from us, and it's you know. It, it ends up, um, when you shop for yourself, you know, when you're in e-commerce, it's really an interesting experience when you're shopping for yourself. That's really when you get a feel for whether or not the product you built is, uh, is, is really uh, good or not. And you certainly find the problems when you shop for yourself, when you get frustrated that you can't find this or find that. 
I'm just uh, looking at all the all the faces on, on, on this call and there's really a lot of future of commerce uh, thought leaders. So I wanna make sure that we get to Q&A soon as so we, can, we can hear from them. Uh, but before that, I wanted to revisit something that we talked uh, about in the very beginning of this call, which was your kind of contrarian view uh, in 2002, uh, when you get, went against what everyone was saying about e-com being, being dead. Uh, and I'm wondering if you're holding a kind of similar contrarian view today, something you believe to be true about the world that other people just don't seem to see, that if you were to start a venture in 2020, you would kind of double down on. I don't know that this is one that people don't see per se, but I think on average people sell it short, which is if you think about the internet, it's fundamentally transforming. It's, it's really the internet combined with the, with uh, smartphones. So the fact that you're carrying a computer in your pocket or your purse, the combination of the two, so the global network coupled with the device, I think it's more or less transforming virtually every industry one by one. And I think, folks, what happens is, okay, they believe that, but then when they get into the details, they take something that exists today and they only project it forward a little bit. And if you can, I think if you look at the biggest businesses in the world, they're built um, in a way that while they initially solve a problem, they then keep compounding that gain over time and they keep evolving because they're fundamentally going after something very large. And I think there's still tremendous amounts of opportunity because if you look at the evolution kind of pre-internet to where we are today, it's still very modest relative to where things will be when you roll forward through time. And you, you have, you know, the generation of folks, you know, who've grown up with, um, uh, you know, the, the Apple iPhone was only launched in 2007. So if you think about the iPhone, it's only 13 years old. And so you think about the generation of folks who've now grown up with this type of technology, you know, they're basically, they're still, you know, they're not out of their twenties. And so there's just so much change that's gonna to continue to occur as you have more and more folks who are effectively using this technology as a native, you know, natural, original experience. So I tend to think people under, um, under envision what the future will be. And uh, on that note, I think we should uh, open it up. As I, as I said, that there's uh, it's a really impressive group on, on the line today. And now we're gonna turn to Q&A. start uh, with uh, Annabelle Jack, who is the Chief Commercial Officer at Made.com, and then for that was at MyDeco with, with Brem. So Annabelle definitely knows a, a thing or two about the home as well. Thank you so much for that, Naraj. Obviously, um, Made.com looked to Wafer for a huge amount of inspiration all the time. Um, and similarly, when we were at MyDeco as well, I have very fond memories of us trying to grab loads of domain names, looking at what CSN stores have done and all of us being like accountable for like being a charge of 10 domain names each or whatever, and really trying to follow your strategy there. But um, I was, I guess I was most interested to understand um, what excites you most um, in your kind of role at Wayfair today to keep you as CEO there for nearly kind of 20 years, which kind of feels like a, a long time. And understandably, it's a fantastic business, but I wanted to kind of know what is the one thing that kind of most excites you that, that keeps you in your role there for such a long time? Yeah, so to me, it's the fact that, you know, despite the size we're at on an absolute, um, you know, dollar or whatever basis, we still view it as a super early days. So mm -hmm. when, when you look at the plans, when I, when I talk to different groups in the company about the plans we have or think about what we're investing in, what we're trying to do, it just feels like the whole, you know, we're it's still, you know, kind of the very beginning of the journey. And that is just, it gets, to me, that's what's really exciting. I think if we viewed it as, oh, we have a mature business and it's very large, very profitable, but just ticking away, you know, grow a few percent per year. I do not think that might be a great business, but I wouldn't be particularly excited to spend all my days on it. It's, it's the fact that we're still so early. And so we have the entrepreneurial sort of opportunity in front of us. But we also have the resources to kind of pursue it with ambition. And then that, that's the combo. And what makes it feel really entrepreneurial then? Because that's quite an amazing thing to do when you've got 16,000 people, I guess, still in the business. So what we try to do is we try to take an approach of, we try to prioritize what we want to do, but then what we do is we'll pick or hire a really strong leader to pursue that agenda. And we'll try to have each area run fairly autonomously, kind of orchestrated around the strategies, um, kind of being uh, collectively uh, 
tight, but the actual execution be um, such that they can run on parallel paths so that, and then what we'll do is we have about a hundred of these teams. We, every six months, we do a, a business review of each of these efforts to figure out if we have problems or if we need to resource things more or what have you. But this allows us to kind of parallel path more things. And then as we feel like we can take on more things, we'll just start an incremental new team. And so rather than having kind of the traditional sort of um, kind of uh, structure of, you know, a lot of companies have like committees and reviews and all these types of things, annual budgets. We try to not have any of that because we think it'll stifle innovation. We'd rather have these teams have a lot of autonomy and be able to drive things forward and just bet on that team being really smart about making good decisions. Thank you so much for that, for that question, Annabelle. I think we have uh, another question for, from our LP, Tesh Lavani, who is uh, also the CEO of Vitabiotics, which is, uh, of course, Europe's largest uh, vitamins and supplements company. Hi, Neeraj. Congratulations on your success, firstly. Um, extremely well done and uh, rapid growth. It's uh, really, really amazing. So my question is in two parts, but I'll start with the first bit. Um, obviously, the lockdown has been great for businesses which have a good direct-to-consumer model. And um, with furniture, um, some people find it easy to shop online. Some people find it difficult. They need to physically see the furniture and then buy it. But with, with the lockdown, it sort of forced people into having to buy things online and reduce the fr fr friction, which means a lot of new customers will come in to your business and you've seen that growth. Um, moving out of the lockdown, um, how do you plan to retain uh, the, the customers? Uh, obviously, you've got new customers that have come in, but what would you be doing to be able to, uh, to build on that and to ensure that you still have that sort of traffic and volume in, in uh, digital? What we find is once customers um, spend the time you know, to find an item they like and buy it and then have it delivered to them, we find that their excitement about having being an online purchaser in the future is actually very high. And so a lot of the friction is around making that initial leap to giving it a try. And so the big things we focus on are how do we just make every part of the journey better and better? So in other words, how do we make product discovery better and better, whether that's with visual imagery, whether that's with the personalization algorithms, whether that's with what we're doing with email and app notifications, whether, you know, there's a whole lot of efforts there. And how do we make the delivery experience, you know, whether it be faster or easier to schedule or have you make that better and better. And so the idea is if you keep improving all those key things, each time someone buys from you, hopefully the experience they have is a little better than the last time. And each time a new customer buys from us, hopefully they have such a good experience that they're in that large cohort and decide to try it again into the future. And so we have this kind of idea of continually improving everything with there being no end in mind. Like you can just keep driving up that. And the, the basic concept is, as you'd think in most internet business, like, how do I reduce friction? So the, the, just assume there's friction in every step. What is the most obvious thing that we could do to reduce friction? Maybe top three things. How do we do that there? And just take a view of assuming that there's friction everywhere. And, just ha that, and that's the idea of why we have with so many teams. Each team is tackling an area, and we assume that that area can drive benefit. And then you can sometimes measure exactly what that benefit is. And sometimes you can't, sometimes you can tell how much better it got, but you can't necessarily tell what return you're getting due to it. But we have this innate belief that if you reduce friction um, in, in, in the way of helping the customer, you're going to get paid back. So you just sort of just keep working at that. And we think that you can then measure the result in totality by just seeing customers repeat rates rise and seeing customers conversion rates increase. And that, you know, unless you run out of market share to get, you know, there's no reason why that wouldn't keep powering you forward. Yeah, no, I think that makes total sense because I also believe that the phrase that if it ain't broke, don't fix it doesn't apply today. You really have to keep having that incremental improvement all the time continuously. Um, so the other part of the question was, um, well, obviously with what's happened with the pandemic, it's affected retail hugely, and uh, which means there could be opportunities in terms of getting retail space. So I'm sure you've thought about this, but would uh, Wafer be a brand that could work at retail level and having that touch point, which could engage customers even more to then move on to your online experience? Yeah, we, yeah, so yes, we do. And the way we think about it, if you go back in our history, the, the early days of our history, we built the company really off quantitative online advertising. It's a highly measurable, very transactional focus. 
then over time, as we had a brand, we started doing other things, whether it be displaying other types of brand oriented advertising or ultimately television, which you know was a key lever in how we built up our brand to household awareness. Um, we figured out the right recipe for direct mail. And so today we have, you know, television is around about 15% of what we spend. Uh, direct mail is about 10%, online is about 75%. And we spend, you know, significant amount of money, you know, a billion dollars plus in, in advertising. When we think of stores as a capability that could really add significant value because it, the, the channels I just mentioned, you know, you, you can basically on a television spot, you can tell a story that you can't really tell with a display unit where you can still tell more of a story than you can with the text ad. But in an in-person interaction, there's a set of things you can do that you couldn't do in really any of the channels I mentioned. And you really couldn't even do with the phone-based customer service and other things that we provide. And so we actually have one store today uh, well, we have, two, we have an outlet store where we sell returns, but then we have one store that's meant to be like a, a, a brand store accomplishing what I think you're asking about. And it's sort of like we view it as an R&D test right now. We're trying different concepts and we're not necessarily, um, we're trying to understand different things that we have in mind to figure out what effects they have to find a model that then we will scale up. And we view it in a, as a marketing channel in the way I just described the other marketing channels where it financially would need to be productive as part of the total mix. And we tend to think that we can, by having more kind of uh, arrows in your quiver, you can basically, you're going to basically be able to reach more customers in more nuanced ways and in aggregate, get them to understand the offering more deeply. And as a result, you can get much more share of wallet from them of their total home spend than you will otherwise. And you can deepen the loyalty. And so I think it'll just take us some time to figure out the exact recipe. But I think each of our brands, I think there's a, there's a role for brick and mortar stores. We just need to figure it out. And then there'll be a question as to how many stores is the right number, because I think certain retailers today have a challenge, as you said, not just because sales are shifting online, but I think some stores models, particularly in the United States, have been overbuilt. And so they just have too many locations relative to what's productive. And so you uh, obviously wouldn't want to end up there. And, and would the model work um, as in people would come in and see the stuff and then order it online, or would they pick it up and go? What do you think would work with your? Well, in the one store that we're piloting now, we have a mix. And so we, we, there's items you order, then we have smaller items you can take with you. That's one of the things you need to figure out because we, our offering is so vast, there's no way you're going to be able to really showcase everything. And so how do you really make it immersive so someone understands the broad value proposition, but then perhaps there are some categories of items you do want them to be able to just take something with them if it's a more immediate need or a gift or what have you. Great. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Antonio, who is the CEO of SGO, uh, an investor group investing at the intersection of government and uh, society. Yes, thank you. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good. Excellent talk. Congrats, of course, on, on great success. W one of the things that I was curious about, and of course, this is a key question for any kind of app and internet business, is, is retention. Uh, and I mean, I would love to understand, you know, how, how was that process of and how is still that process today of increasing retention? What do you think are kind of the long hanging fruit that you can tell anyone starting an internet business, you know, to increase retention? What was specifically for you and kind of what are the strategies that you think have worked the best? Yeah. So at the end of the day, like the single best set of metrics that we think tell the future health of the business are all the repeat metrics. So the, you know, uh, new customer repeat rate, the repeat indices, uh, you know, looking at different cohorts and their repeat rates uh, relative to one another. Um, th those really fundamentally tell you um, whether or not you're going to be successful. The reason we've grown so fast is actually that repeat orders uh, have grown at a faster rate um, than our average growth uh, every quarter since we went public five years ago. And so repeat actually pulls up our growth rate. New is actually below our overall growth rate. And that's simply because we keep really tight financial guardrails on how much money we'll spend on advertising to attract new customers. And the math works because once we get them, we know that the quality of the experience causes them to repeat. And the repeat's very inexpensive from an advertising standpoint. And that's what powers the business. At the end of the day, repeat is just an outcome of everything you do. And so that's why that, I, that view I, I initially mentioned about the customer orientation, but then that view of kind of constantly looking to remove friction and improve every area of the experience matters because they fundamentally, they contribute to the satisfaction level and then the repeat that the customer will do. So we don't view retention as a siloed activity. 
we view retention as the outcome of the customer experience and we view it as everyone's responsibility to improve the customer experience. And so tactically, we measure that by, you know, reducing friction um, and the reduction of friction we view as the direct, um, that directly benefits customers being happy and then the repeat. And I think in any service business, if you don't, if you don't focus on that, unless you're in some sort of kind of quasi monopoly position, you're going to end up getting disintermediated by whoever offers a better service because customers, they can be incredibly loyal, but they'll only be incredibly loyal up to the level that they're confident that you're the best place for them. You know, and if they find somewhere that provides better service, they're going to go and they're going to tell everyone about it. So, so to us, this is like the lifeblood of the business. Uh, we have time for two more questions. So we're going to come to Spencer, co-founder of First Minute, and to John, who is the founder of SwiftK, uh, which he sold to Microsoft. Uh, John, should we start with you? Great, thank you. Um, thanks so much. Really appreciate your kind of candid advice and, and feedback. I mean, I think one of the things I got really excited about is you say that we're so big already, but we're only 1% of the way there, and just how big the opportunity is ahead. And I think looking at it kind of afresh from a, from a distance, I think one of the things I wonder is you got this huge trend around internet, around smartphones going on. But at the same time, there's room for disruption within that. So you've got kind of different needs between, I know, Gen Z coming in, digital natives, you've got maybe an older generation coming online for the first time during COVID. I guess it's kind of what keeps you up at night. You see, you see so 99% to grow into, but also that's 99% of the others. Do you feel that you've kind of got strong defensive positions from the network effects and the scale you've got to? Or do you see there's opportunity for kind of a large scale disruption, even now when you've got big players like yourself seemingly dominating um, the market? So I'm kind of interested in kind of changing consumer needs and areas of disruption that you see in the kind of next five to 10 years. Yeah, so the way, the way we think about our business, if, if we stay agile and nimble and entrepreneurial and very customer oriented, there effectively will not be room for someone to disrupt us because effectively those would be the advantages that the disruptor has. And they would be disrupting us because we were acting in a manner of sort of being content, happy with the status quo, not necessarily leaning forward. And so I think in every market you have large companies. And then the question is, how aggressive are they leaning into the future? And therefore, how big is the opportunity for someone to come in and disrupt them? And I think a lot of large companies basically do act in a slower manner. They're more content. They're not necessarily yearning. Um, uh, to, to find the next thing to do. And that, that's where those opportunities exist. Um, I think what a lot of companies are seeing is that that approach is increasingly problematic in today's world. So I think companies are trying to figure out how to move faster. But I think ones that don't have that culture, it's just hard to change. And, and they may not have the right team members to change that. They may not have the willingness. Um, we certainly feel like if we, you know, staying entrepreneurial is not just uh, about um, how, how do we try to get more done? It's, it's about, you know, that's, that's how you win. Right. And so it's the same way we came from being super small to becoming uh, one of the competitors to becoming the largest competitor. Well, if you give that up, you're effectively starting to decay. And at some point you will be set up to be disrupted. Thanks for that question, John. And, um, a little hint, John is also a very active and thoughtful angel investor. Uh, Spencer, let's uh, let's finish off with uh, with your question, because we are almost out of time. Super nice. Thank you so much. I was I was really interested when you were speaking about the the depth of your friendship with Steve and and how you move towards different parts of the business pretty early on. I was just wondering from a from a psychological point of view whether you felt the way that you and he saw the world was always very complementary because obviously a lot of the time as seed investors we try to meet founding teams and understand how how they're additive to to each other as co-founders and sort of away from away from product or tech or marketing just was there was it really obvious that the that the fit as as characters was was going to be a robust one well i think you know so we had the benefit like we weren't necessarily out seeking a co-founder trying to think about who that could be it was more that we we had been friends so at that point we'd been friends for for the entirety of of, of college of university and so for four years We've been friends, we've been roommates for a couple of those years. Um, and we were actually, the way we got started in our first business was our last semester at college. We were taking an entrepreneurship course and it was the court of the project um, with the business plan that we wrote for the course as the main project that it was effectively an outgrowth of that, that we started our first business. And so we had the, you know, we already had that, that 
comfort with one another. And so that building up that friendship was a nice, easy way to do it. I think the challenge, if you sort of uh, become co-founders with someone you don't know well, you definitely run the risk that perhaps your personalities are incompatible or you don't really understand the person because someone who you just meet, there's no chance you know them that well, right? You get to know someone over time. So I think that is uh, riskier, but th that, that can work too. You know, we just had the good fortune of sort of already having known each other. That's really helpful. Thank you. After venture number one and two, was there any question that it was uh, you and Steve who were going to build venture number three together, or were you uh, were you thinking about another co-founder? No, we were we were clearly going to go do number three. Third, third times the the charm, uh, it seems. Um, again, uh, it's been such a pleasure speaking speaking uh, with you. Huge congrats on uh, on an absolutely phenomenal 2020, uh, and uh, thanks to everyone on on this call for all the thoughtful questions. <laughs>